Hello, greetings. Welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Moreau Seiler, and I'm the Stewardship Coordinator of the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Carla Church will be speaking about Tigers on the Prowl, an introduction to salamanders on the prairies. I'd like to start by stating we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For millennia, they've worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. Before we begin, I'd like to note that PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation about anything to do with Native Prairie conservation or species at risk. I'd like to invite you to join us for a presentation about woody encroachment in Saskatchewan on January 31st by Zulin Go from the University of Saskatchewan. And a reminder to all of our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the presentation, feel free to type it into the question section of the webinar dashboard anytime during the presentation. And if you're on the cell phone app, you can just send your question by chat to the organizer. And we'll be answering questions at the end of the webinar. I'd like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association, Eco-Friendly West, Enbridge, Information Services Corporation, Saskatchewan Wild Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, SASTEL, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. In-kind support has been provided by Manitoba Habitat Heritage Corporation, the University of Winnipeg, and the Manitoba Conservation Data Centre. So without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter. Carla has been working in wildlife and conservation for 13 years. Her obsession with salamanders started eight years ago, and it was love at first sight. She's continued to work with herpetofauna and species at risk across Manitoba and she's currently completing her master's degree on eastern tiger salamanders while working full-time in conservation. Her love for all things slimy, scaly and hard-shelled continues as her passion for the outdoors and conserving Manitoba's important ecosystems. So with that I'm pleased to pass it over to Carla. Okay. I just need to remember how to share my screen here. Oh, here we go, show my screen. Ha, okay. Um, great, so my name is Carla Church. Um, I'm a wildlife biologist uh, specializing in species at risk in Manitoba. Um, as mentioned, I am finishing my master's degree on uh, Eastern tiger salamanders um, in my final year. It has been a part-time um, project for me as I do work full-time in conservation. So let's start. Hold on. Okay, so let's start with what is a salamander. Uh, <laughs> they're both mythical and real. Um, the word salamander derived from the Greek uh, word basically loosely meaning fire lizard. Um, so a couple of myths about fire, about salamanders, uh, that they create fire, that they can put out fire, or that they are fire. But in fact, they are not fire. Um, this myth probably arose from the fact that they would hibernate or hide in logs that were tossed into the fire and then they would crawl out. Um, yes. So what is a salamander continued? Uh, they are an amphibian um, that are typically characterized by their lizard-like appearance. They have a slender body, blunt snouts, short limbs, and possess a tail and uh, in both larval and adult forms. Salamanders rarely have more than four toes on their front legs and five on their rear legs. While some species lacked hind legs or hind limbs Altogether, all adults in Canada do have four legs. Um, they have tails and teeth in both jaws. I use the term teeth, but it's a bit more uh, like a bumpy surface. But for all intents and purposes, we'll just call them teeth for now. And they are capable of regenerating lost limbs. Um, this has been sort of an interesting thing for some re researchers that are looking into using these regenerative processes for potential human medical applications. Their permeable skin does make them reliant on habitats that are in or near water or other cool, damp places. 
Some salamanders are fully aquatic, some take to water intermittently, and some are fully terrestrial as adults. So just a quick uh, slide about salamanders versus newts. All newts are salamanders, but not all our salamanders are newts. Salamanders have uh, longer and rounded tails and well-developed toes. And newts have webbed toes and a paddle-like tail. So there are a few more other differences you can see on the slide here, but they are uh, all, the, basically the takeaway here is that all newts are salamanders, but not all salamanders are newts. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the world status of amphibians. Um, the IUCN Red List has described 8,536 species. They have evaluated 7,486, so about 88%. On the low end, 35, and on the high end, 51%, or the average of about 41% of those species are threatened. Um, the uh, there's a bit of a debate here about the total number of salamanders worldwide, but a general number that I could find was about 740 species, and about 121 of those are critically endangered. So amphibians are definitely one of the most vulnerable uh, species on the planet currently. So a little bit about the threats. So um, a common uh, theme around a lot of species at risk is habitat, uh, habitat destruction or loss or fragmentation. During the last 200 years, an estimated of 53% of wetlands have been lost in the U.S. to human development. Um, this data is from 1998, so it may be a little out of date at the moment. Um, Manitoba has lost anywhere from 40 to 70% of their wetlands. Timber harvest, clear cutting, and other forestry activities change the soil temperature, soil compaction, and are generally degrading of the habitat for salamanders. Um, road mortality is another issue. So inopportune traffic in migration times can have a major impact on salamanders. Some places have actually closed highways to mitigate this, which I think is a, is a really great step in the right direction. So as I mentioned before, uh, salamanders have permeable skin. So pesticides, chemicals, and other pollution can really uh, have an impact on salamander population. More specifically, it impacts individual um, individuals of the species. So it can have an impact on fitness, interfere with immune function, and the salamander's ability to avoid predation. Climate change events such as drought cause desiccation of terrestrial salamanders and dry up breeding ponds, um, which you can imagine would cause a really big issue. The other side of that is too much water um, can actually cause overland flooding. So that may bring in an introduction of fish species that weren't previously in that pond or infectious diseases or may flood burrows. So a few of the infectious diseases that are on the radar right now are b cell, um, which is a salamander chytrid disease, BD, and ATV, which is a uh, Ambostoma trigonum virus. I don't know a lot about these diseases, but I do know that when I go into different water bodies, I make sure that all of my gear has been cleaned to the standards of the Manitoba Aquatic Invasive Species uh, Act. Uh, so we're making sure that we're not carrying these diseases between ponds. And then the pet trade. If we're moving salamanders or other amphibians into places that they shouldn't be, we risk moving these diseases around, as well as releasing uh, different animals into places that may cause a lot of problems in that habitat. So this is a bit of an aside. Uh, I'd like to talk just a little bit about biofluorescence. Um, it's really kind of a neat thing, and it's uh, not something that uh, is talked about a lot yet, but it's the absorption of electromagnetic radiation at one wavelength and re-emitting at a, a lower energy and longer wavelength. So some of these salamanders with really bold patterns and colors fluorescent really brightly. You can see in the image here, there is an Ambostoma tigrinum or eastern tiger salamander that uh, all the yellow spots are glowing very brightly. Um, 
some of the areas that are otherwise not visible under normal conditions defloresce distinctly. So again, in the image, you can see on the left-hand side, there's a, um, the cloacal region is glowing brightly. Uh, some of the bones and digits are also visible. And salamanders will have a, a mucus-like um, secretion that can also glow. Um, so it's really quite interesting. So why are salamanders important? Uh, salamanders play an important role in ecosystem health. They are a mid-level predator. Um, so they are prey for many species, but they also eat a lot of different species. So they can indirectly affect species diversity and ecosystem processes. They feed on earthworms, insects, small mice, voles, frogs, and even other salamanders. They are also prey for many species, so fish, snakes, and birds. They are high in lipids and proteins and supply a high quality stores of energy for consumers. They are vulnerable to both aquatic and soil pollution and are a good measure of ecosystem health. So I want to talk a little bit about salamanders in Canada. Um, I found a couple of different numbers depending on which website I was looking at, but Canada has approximately 47 to 49 species um, the, uh, of amphibians. So Canada is home to either 21 or 23 species of salamanders um, and eight species of mole salamanders. So the mole salamanders is where I'm going to put much of my focus in the rest of this presentation. So mole salamanders or ambistomatidae are biphasic, so they do require two different habitat types for their life cycle. Adults are typically found in underground burrows. Um, when they do move, they tend to move only a few hundred meters away from their breeding pond. Uh, mole salamanders are endemic to North America. Their aquatic habitat is usually fishless, semi-permanent or permanent water bodies, and they may or may not have abundant emergent vegetation. So if this image is a bit hard to see, but um, you can see a couple of uh, egg masses attached to some of the vegetation in the pond, um, they do require something to attach their egg masses to. So the water has to be present for at least three to seven months. Um, in Manitoba, the breeding season is usually early or late April till about mid-August. So that does require that the breeding ponds here have water for, I think, four to five months at a minimum. The terrestrial habitat is usually, usually friable or sandy soils, basically something that they can dig a burrow into to um, hide, and then um, <laughs> many hiding spots. So, of course, they want to avoid predation as well as desiccation on the landscape. So as soon as they exit the water, they're looking for, for a place to hide. So I love, I love this comic. Um, I think it's quite fantastic. A couple of defenses for salamanders. Uh, hiding is a good one. If you just can't be seen, you can't be eaten. Uh, a lot of salamanders are nocturnal, so they're going to be moving in the uh, nighttime hours. To, and uh, they do produce a toxic or repellent secretion. So it's just kind of tastes bad. And, and uh, sometimes animals are just not going to want to eat something that, that tastes bad. So a bit about breeding, um, as mentioned before, these uh, mole salamanders are going to breed in the early spring. They will even cross the snow if necessary to get to their breeding ponds. Uh, sometimes the ponds still have a bit of ice on them, but they will dive in as long as there is some um, unfrozen surface. The males are going to nudge the females um, to see if that she's interested. Uh, he will then lay a, a spermatophore on the bottom of the pond, which is basically a little packet of genetic material. Interested females will pick that up into her cloaca um, with an internal fertilization. 
the females will then lay a cluster of eggs below the surface. So on the image there, you can see um, um, egg mass of salamanders versus an egg mass of what's likely a frog, guessing frog species, toad, no, frog species. Um, males will reach sexual maturity in about two years. Females take about three to five years. Unfortunately, most salamanders in the wild will die before they're six years old. So um, making sure that there's a constant uh, pond available and breeding season is, is important for the population in, in an area. So salamanders in Manitoba, uh, there are four species of salamanders. Uh, Manitoba has three mole salamanders and one aquatic salamander. So the aquatic salamander is a common mud puppy or Nectaris maculosus. It can grow up to 50 centimeters, including the tail. Um, it is a wholly aquatic salamander, and they're usually found in rocky bottom streams. Every once in a while, I'll hear a story about um, ice fisher fisher people <laughs> who will pull up um, a mud puppy while they're ice fishing out on the rivers or the lakes, so they are active throughout the winter. Uh, Blue-spotted salamander, uh, Ambostoma laterale, is a, a salamander that does occur in Manitoba on the east side. It's up to 13 centimeters, so it's quite small. Um, it does have bright blue spots, which is really quite interesting to see. Um, they occur in moist woodlands and wetland edges. This is one that you may find in your wood pile. Um, this salamander occurs from Manitoba all the way to basically Halifax. So it is quite a wide ranging salamander, um, but we're in Manitoba, we're on the far um, Western side. Uh, here's my favorite of the mole salamanders, the Eastern tiger salamander or Ambostoma tigrinum. Um, this salamander can grow up to 13 centimeters, including the tail, and again is found in moist grasslands or woodlands uh, near wetlands. So I will continue to talk about the species uh, further in the presentation. Salamanders in Saskatchewan. Actually, I'm just kidding. There are salamanders in Saskatchewan, but there's only one species. So the Western tiger salamander, salamander also known as Ambostoma. Mavortium. It's also known as a barred salamander or gray tiger salamander. Uh, this is very similar to the eastern. It grows up to 33 centimeters, including the tail. Again, moist grasslands or woodlands near wetlands. Um, it was uh, originally thought that the eastern and western tiger salamanders were the same species, just subspecies of each other. And so a lot of the literature regarding Eastern or Western salamanders don't make the distinction between the two. Um, so there, it is a little bit complicated to look at some of the older studies um, because they're looking at these two as if they're the same, the same species. So currently the idea is that the Western tiger salamander is west of the Red River in Manitoba and is uh, occurs all the way through Saskatchewan and Alberta and then just dips into parts of BC. So I, I do want to talk a little bit more about um, the the eastern because that is really my focal species. Uh, so the, as mentioned before, um, the tiger salamanders were originally assessed as the same species by Kasiwik or the Committee of the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. So the Great Lakes population was considered extirpated. The prairie boreal population was not at risk and the southern mountain population was endangered. In 2008, Ambostoma tigrinum was elevated to species separate from Ambostoma mavortium, and then in 2012, Kasiwik gave uh, tigrinum and mavortium two separate designations. So the eastern tiger salamander designation, Kasiwik um, has, has the prairie population listed as endangered, that was in 20. 13 and the Carolinian population list is extirpated. The Carolinian population is a bit of a, a conundrum. Um, it's in southern Ontario and there is some thought that the salamanders that were found in the area were not eastern tiger but these salamanders were found in the 
I believe in the 1920s. And so they haven't been found since then. And so we haven't been able to do any sort of genetic testing or um, really look at that population. So it is considered extirpated, but some people believe that it just didn't exist. So the prairie population is the population in Manitoba. So currently the only population of Eastern tiger salamanders in Canada is in Manitoba. So the Species at Risk Act, or SARA, has listed Eastern tiger salamanders as endangered as of 2018, and the Manitoba Endangered Species Act does not recognize tiger salamanders uh, currently, so they're not listed. So the original area, if you read the original Kosiwak reports, you can see that it was listed as the Stuart Burn area of Manitoba. So on the, the bottom of the screen, there's a cluster of red dots with the occasional green dots. That was the original um, area that was considered to be the range of eastern tiger salamanders in Manitoba. Through some of the research that I've been doing in the last several years, uh, we've been able to expand that range throughout most of the sandy lands. So all those dots on the um, east of Steinbach, that is where we currently find eastern tiger salamanders. So they're actually known to go all the way up to the number one highway, um, which is a uh, quite an extension of range, um, but it is a little bit more complicated than that, which I will talk about in a in the next couple of slides. So finding tiger salamanders in Manitoba has been a very difficult um, but fascinating project. Um, I originally went through and used these old firefighting maps that were given to me. Um, it was it's understood that uh originally so the sandy lands is a provincial forest that was used for logging um still is but not quite to the same extent that it was before and so it is subject to forest fires um so this map is an old map that was given to me that shows where all these firefighting dugout ponds were were placed and then um where all the fire um, towers were were and which what the range of their visual um, place to basically to watch out for for, for fire fires was um, so I used this map I drove all the fire guard roads the thing that doesn't work to find these ponds is Google Maps because unfortunately they are so small and the imagery is so coarse that you can't actually find them. So I've done a lot of driving through the sandy lands which I recommend because it's a beautiful place but that's how we've been able to find all of these different ponds throughout the years. So I do the sampling in two different ways. So I start in the spring using visual searches for egg masses. I've become very familiar with what a tiger salamander egg mass looks like. So you can see that on the left side of the screen. They tend to be quite uh, globular, loose sort of gelatinous balls that over time will loosen up till they basically disintegrate when the larval salamanders um, become free free existing individuals, I guess. Um, and then I go back in the fall and I trap the larvae. So this has been working extremely well for me over the years. Um, I've been able to confirm almost every pond that I found egg masses in, I've been able to come back in the fall and find larval salamanders. Um, these are just some of the pictures of some of the students who've been working with me over the years. Uh, this is a little bit out of date, unfortunately, but um, then in 2012 surveyed, uh, sorry, 2017, we surveyed 12 sites and then continued to increase the sites over the years. So as of 20, 19, I believe, I uh, had 54 sites and 26 of them were positive for tiger salamanders. This work has continued in 2021 and 2022. Unfortunately, I don't have the updated information to present to you today. Um, one of the interesting things we've also done is flown a drone. So it's, it's when Google Maps didn't work for me, um, Flying the drone really was was a great way to sort of get a, a good 
uh, landscape context for what these ponds are. And I was able to take um, some measurements to, to get an idea of the size of the ponds, the again, the landscape context, the tree species, the canopy cover. Um, I do have some close-up images, so I was able to get a sense of the vegetation in the pond. Um, so it's really worked quite well. It was definitely a challenge to geo-reference all of these photos, again, just because the background imagery was just so coarse. So um, it's been really helpful to get a sense of, of what these ponds look like. Another project that has kind of been working alongside with my thesis, though this is certainly not something that I'm writing up in my thesis, and I apologize to anyone who is a, um, a geneticist. I really don't know anything about genetics, but we have been taking tail clips since 2013. Um, Sorry, we've been taking, we've surveyed, been surveying, but we've been taking genetic tissue since 2016. Um, the, as mentioned previously, salamanders are able to regrow their lost limbs. So this has, um, according to the literature, should have very little impact on the fitness of the salamander once we let them go. So we take up to four samples per pond. Um, Again, this number is probably a little bit out of date. At one point, we had 165 samples collected across Manitoba. Um, I'm sure that's more now. Um, originally, we sent all those samples to the Dr. Bogart at the University of Guelph. Um, he did some mitochondrial DNA, and it sh had shown that the salamanders that we found in the Stewart Burn area Again, the part that was originally assessed by Kasiwik and shown to be the range of salamanders or eastern tiger salamanders in Manitoba. Um, mitochondrially were shown to be western tiger salamanders. And again, I'm I'm not well versed in DNA, so I'm not really sure um, what this means, other than these are possibly hybrids or what we know about western and eastern tiger salamanders is wrong. We did have one sample that went to Guelph um, that was from the Sandylands area, and that was the one sample that was shown to be a true Eastern tiger salamander. So that's why we've been continuing this project over the years. Um, this is some of the work that we've done with the samples. We've subsampled them and sent them off to, to a couple of different places. We've been collaborating with the Canadian Wildlife Service. Um, this is when I was with the Manitoba Conservation Data Center. So I have Alana there and Colin Murray. And um, we've sent all these samples to Dr. Schaefer at the University of, of California. Unfortunately, due to different um, issues arising, we don't have the results yet, but I'm very hopeful and interested to see what's gonna come back. Um, salamander genetics is extremely difficult and I don't pretend to know much about it but it would be very interesting to see where that delineation is between eastern and western tiger salamanders um, or if there is actually a hybrid zone and what what that would mean for conservation of these species um, so the last project i was working on was with riding mountain a national park um, the project was to find out where western tiger salamanders were breeding in the park they did have a bit of an issue with um salamanders getting run over at the gate the primary gate uh at the park um so we were able to come up with a couple of little troubleshooting measures um i believe they cut a couple of of um, divots into their curbs so that salamanders could crawl over them once they're crossing the road but it would, they wanted to know where their salamanders were breeding. Um, so we focused on three different areas, the main gate, uh, the Lake Audi area, and Deep Lake. And we found a lot of adults. Um, so no larval tiger salamanders, which of course presents a bunch of its own questions. Um, unfortunately, I can't share too much about this project as it is a Riding Mountains project, but uh, if you want to know more about it, they do tend to have a lot of, of their information on iNaturalist. So a lot of records are on iNaturalist or um, perhaps contacting the park. You can also find the permit application online if you want to read 
more about the project. Um, this picture is one of the biggest salamanders I have ever seen in my life. It was quite amazing to find that one. Um, so I was really happy about it. So future work. Uh, of course, just continuing to expand the range and known breeding ponds of both eastern and western tiger salamanders. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, amphibians are in in sort of a crisis. They're in severe decline. And so if we can find out where they're breeding, what areas they're using, hopefully we can work towards um, better conservation plans for the future for these species. Of course, more education to the public regarding the sensitivity important of amphibians. Um, that's why some of you are likely here. You want to learn a little bit more about salamanders or um, the importance of having the whole biodiversity network in, in the world is just incredibly important. And we don't know sometimes what a species does until we take it away. And so educating the public is a great way to keep working on on the conservation of the species and having people care for for these different types of things um, and of course just continue dna sampling to really understand where the divide between eastern and western tiger salamanders um, actually lies and and what the differences are and so we can make those plants uh, as mentioned kasiwik and sarah see them as two different species and so how do you write a recovery strategy when you don't really know the where those species exist so continuing continuing research is really important continuing reporting records is really important um, and then getting more landscape scape context for these species is important and uh, I think I talked quite fast today so thank you all for coming I hope you learned something if you have any questions please let me know or you can contact me at uh, at the email address on the screen. Thank you so much, Carla. That's so interesting. I was using the screenshot feature throughout your presentation. And like, oh wow, that's such a neat fact. I'm gonna have to come back to that later. Um, <laughs> so um, to all of our attendees, if you have any questions, um, just type it into the questions section of the webinar dashboard, um, and we'll give everyone a minute. Um, well, well, people will have a chance to type in questions. Um, Carla, would you be able to tell us a little bit about what people can do to help salamanders? Sure. Um, as mentioned, they are they have permeable skin, so limiting your handling of salamanders is important. Uh, you can see in the photo that I'm wearing gloves, so I'm making sure that if I have any mosquito repellent or sunscreen on my hands, I'm not transferring it to the to the salamander. Um, just being aware of wetlands on your property. I mean, this might not be an issue for people who live in the city, but you know, draining of wetlands on farm properties um, is, has, a, has had quite a big impact. So being aware of, of drainage and making sure there's water available for the salamanders. Um, and then I think some of it's just going to be a bigger sort of awareness. So as I mentioned, some places close their highways in migration season. So um, St. Leon, I think, is a town that will actually close their roads because they have a, quite a population of Western tiger salamanders, and so they'll they'll shut down the highway. Perfect. Thanks for that answer. Um, there's somebody in the audience who wants to try to ask it verbally instead of typing it. Um, we don't usually do this, but we're gonna give it a try. Um, John Crowina, are you there? Are you able to to ask your question? <laughs> yes. Okay, yes. Perfect. Thank Thanks. you. Go ahead. <laughs> it just would have taken a while to type it. Um, I um. I drive fairly regularly between Saskatoon and Man uh, Winnipeg, and I usually take the Yellowhead route, uh, and that takes me through the uh, uh, Russell area, Russell, Minnedosa, uh, Nipawa, and um, over the years, uh, I'd say say before 2012, um, around Labor Day, I would see quite a few tiger salamanders unfortunately either dead struck by cars or trying to cross and uh, I tried to do my part and and help them uh, cross when I could 
Um, and uh, but then since about 2014, uh, you hardly see any crossing the highway uh, in that area at all anymore. And actually, a couple of years ago, I I, uh, I made friends with someone at the newspaper in Minnedosa, and I said to her in fall, why don't you uh, do an article about the tiger salamanders migration? And uh, because they need some support here. <laughs> And uh, I think public attitudes in that area about tiger salamanders are very, uh, people don't know a lot about them and there's a lot of ignorance there. And um, I'm sure if people knew more, they would care more and do more. But anyway, uh, and she said, okay, well, I'll keep my eye out for them. Uh, and then a few weeks later, she said to me, well, I, I haven't seen any. So uh, is this some kind of a crash that happened? Is this cyclical or is this uh, just uh, my not being attentive enough? That's a, that's an interesting um, observation. I, I know that the southwest part of Manitoba has definitely experienced a dry cycle in the last 10 years or so. And so part of my job working with the CDC was to um, perform um, Great Plains toad uh, surveys and so I would be out there listening for toads at nighttime and not hearing any and then all of a sudden this year when we had this amazing amount of water on the landscape I heard them everywhere and uh, after 10 years it was such a bizarre experience so I do think that there's a, definitely a dry cycle um, they're having a lot of you know issues with that um, but also I mean the best time to see them is if you're driving at night on a rainy highway which I don't think a lot of people want to do. Um, and so I think it's probably a combination of the dry cycle, not having as many around, and then maybe just missing the, the right time. But yeah, amphibians in general, like I said, they're experiencing a severe, um, like a, a crisis, basically a biodiversity crisis. And so, so many of them are in decline that I'm not really surprised that you've seen less. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, that's that's uh, that's fantastic. Um, a lot of them are just were just as big or bigger than the one in your picture there. So, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, I would say healthy adults at that time. But yeah, I I I wasn't very scientific in terms of recording when I would drive by or you know the dates and times, etc., amount of light, what have you. So. Um, yeah, I I wonder if that Riding Mountain project might have some information that is relevant. Yeah, if you go on, if you're part of iNaturalist, uh, Riding Mountain tends to put a lot of their records on on iNaturalist, so it, it's very public, which I think is amazing. Um, if you happen to see them again, if you take a photo and put it on iNaturalist, then the public can see that, and that would really help us to get a better sense of you know, what time of day, when, what the, the weather was like, where they are, all that information helps. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for that answer, Carla. Um, we have lots of questions that have come in, so um, I can see there's a few duplicates, so I'll try to um, ask them together if that works out. Um, so the first question, there's a few people asking, um, if a water body dries up that they, that's used for breeding, um, like how well can they move to other water bodies and how far can an adult salamander travel? That's a great question. Um, Kind of part of the problem is that a lot of these water bodies will have water in the spring and then dry up over the summer. And those larval salamanders that are stuck or left behind or, you know, um, growing, they will just dry up and die, unfortunately. And so the the salamanders, the adult salamanders don't really care if there's water throughout the summer. They care if there's water when they're breeding. Um, the benefits of having some of those water bodies dry up on occasion is that it can get rid of fish that, that are definitely predators to salamanders and sort of reset the pond um, so that the next year it's, it's better for them. But if it happens a bunch of years in a row, uh, it's a good chance that population just will cease to exist. 
Salamanders can travel a few hundred meters away from their pond, but and adults are fairly um, basically devoted to their breeding pond. And so it's more likely that the juveniles will disperse. And so if you if you have a pond that's constantly dry and you have no juveniles to disperse, then that population's in big trouble. And the one one person's written in that um they found a salamander over a kilometer away from the nearest water body. Um, is that possible? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Juvenile, like juvenile salamanders, definitely will just go for a walk. I mean, I assume wow. they don't have a greater landscape context, so they're probably just going to point in a direction and go. As long as they're not predated or desiccated, uh, I don't think there's a limit to how far they can go. It just doesn't really make a lot of sense for them to do a lot of traveling other than to find a new water body to breed so they're not having a you know an inbreeding problem so um i'm not surprised and you might you might not know maybe there's a small ditch or something that they happen to make it through the summer you know it's a very small body of water that they need the the one behind me here is quite large but they're often um very very small so. Okay, interesting. Um, so Diana is wondering if there's anything that uh, she can do in her prairie dugout to increase its habitability for salamanders. Uh, they definitely don't want to have a clear cut around. So if it's if it's um, you know, they they need to have a couple of fallen logs certainly help. Um, making sure there's no fish. I mean, not that you can choose that or not but don't introduce fish on purpose i guess um and then just not clearing away all the the deadfall so making sure that they can move or hide freely and and not be exposed to the sun or to predators so. okay and do, do you know of any programs that promote amphibian breeding ponds i don't actually <laughs> i okay. think that's something that's probably flying under the radar quite a lot uh you know, as I mentioned, people just don't know about this stuff. So I, yeah. I would be great if we could start one. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you do you know how long it takes for a salamander to regrow their tail? Uh, that's a great question. I was given a, <laughs> was given a salamander that someone hit with a whipper snipper, like a oh. weed eating thingy yeah and it had a big uh gash on its face and that salamander would refuse to eat for several months and then was able to heal itself and so they store quite a bit of fat in their body um, if they're fed well and then they just several months and so if you actually look on youtube there is a video that someone had posted about a salamander completely regrowing a leg that was bitten off so yeah. Wow. Yeah. That would have been really interesting for you to see that though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh it's amazing, but they're they're very resilient and so it's it's really amazing what they can do. Oh, that's, that's really nice. We can cool. take these genetic samples and not worry about impacting um the population because we know absolutely. that that dead stuff will grow back. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Kathy is wondering if you know how to distinguish between Western and Eastern tiger salamanders. And uh, she comments that she found one this summer in Frontier, Saskatchewan, and thought it was an Eastern, but it's not in the range. No, uh, that would definitely be a Western tiger. Um, as okay. I mentioned, the only known range of Easterns is in the Sandylands of Manitoba. And so um, there are several subspecies of western tiger and so if you look on the rage map um the ones that we have in manitoba are considered amostoma mavortium dial dial okay yeah uh, anyways it's a uh, there's lots of subspecies and prior to uh 2012 i think they were all considered one species and so looking at them would be very difficult to tell uh you'd have to go by range and then of course dna but we can't. We're working on that. Yeah, yeah. So there's no easy answer. <laughs> no, I would Just say based on range, I guess, right? Yeah. If it's in Saskatchewan, it's a hundred percent a a western. Okay, that is good to know. Um, 
And Dane is wondering, do they hibernate communally or do they just need to be under the frost line? They will just need to be under the frost line. They're, they're actually fairly individual. So you don't often find salamanders together except when they're breeding. But I'm, of course, referring to Easterns. Um, I know there's been some interesting work with Westerns where you, you're, you'll find them sort of sunbathing at the edge of the water uh, in the summer months, whereas Easterns, once the breeding season is over, they're gone to basically never be seen again until the next breeding season. Um, so they're just looking for a burrow where they can not freeze and they sort of, they don't really hibernate as much as they go into um, like a low uh, output state. Well, they still eat if there's insects moving, but they're not, they aren't moving themselves very much. Okay, so it's not a true hibernation then? No. no. Okay. Oh, interesting. Um, and Caitlin is wondering, are there any, is there any competition between frogs and sal salamanders? Like you showed us that picture with both the salamander and frog eggs on the same vegetation. Yes. Uh, if, if one of those species can fit something in their mouth, they're probably going to eat it. So salamanders will actually eat other salamanders. Um, they, they hunt by basically movement. And so if they see something moving out of the you know, corner of their eye, let's say, they're just going to react. And so if it fits, they're going to eat it. And so, yeah. Okay. And can frogs and salamanders coexist in the same pond? That's a, that's an interesting question. Maybe, um, again, if, if, if they don't get eaten, then they probably could, but I don't often find that. I usually find one or the other. Um, so I assume that if the other was there, they probably were all eaten. Um, so I'm not really sure what the answer is to that, but again, they're gonna, they're just gonna eat what they can eat. Yeah, and because you mentioned that um, salamanders will live in water bodies without fish, right? That's right, um, and... unless their fish are small enough where they, the salamanders can eat them. But in all of my years of study, I found a single pond that had salamanders and fish at the same time. And then I haven't found that since then. And so I think it was a one-off where the salamanders outgrew the fish and they were able to survive. But that's really a very uncommon thing. Okay, interesting. Um, so we have a couple questions about um, the species. So uh, Jessica's wondering if there's been any research done using eDNA, environmental DNA, to determine species presence. There has been a bit. Uh, I know that CWS or uh, the Canadian Wildlife Service was trying a project with eDNA. Unfortunately, since salamander DNA is just so complicated, um, and we don't really have a lot of the proper primers and things. Again, I'm not a geneticist, so pardon me if you are. Um, it's just been a very difficult journey. And so I know there has been work to do that because it would be so much easier if we could just take a scoop of water and say, yes, they're salamanders or they aren't. Um, but I know that it hasn't really worked out the way we we're hoping so far. But I, I do hope that that work continues because it would be, it would be a, a big help. Yeah, for sure. Um, and Michael's wondering, why do you think there's only one species of salamander in Saskatchewan? I don't, I don't know. Um, I know that the, the blue spotted is much more of a woodland species. And so you tend to kind of find it in the boreal forest. Um, uh, and there's a few species that occur in the mountain area, like sort of Alberta, BC in the mountains, but for some reason, I guess the uh, Western is the only one that occurs in Saskatchewan. Um, there are a few species that come up to sort of the northern states, but we haven't found them so far in Canada. So there's a, a yellow spotted salamander um, and a few others, but uh, you know, we're cold. It's cold up here. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, for sure. Okay, um, and Neil is wondering if you have any word on salamanders closer to the Red River corridor, um, specifically Morris. So we, I did have uh, a paper that I looked at that had found, they were actually looking, I think, at fish and they found salamanders in Morris specifically. Um, but I haven't done any research in that area because my focus is 
is Easterns. So it is assumed that those would be a Western tiger salamander. Um, but if we could get some DNA samples from there, that would be wonderful so that we can really sort of define um, which salamander species that is. So based on habitat, it would be likely a Western. Um, but if you have any records, of course, again, we'd love to put them in iNaturalist so that we can access those records. Or you can email the CDC um, specifically, but I don't have that contact information anymore. Okay, thanks. Um, and then Erica's wondering, um, she says, in the context of writing a management plan for an area that has lots of tourism and bordered by highways, do you know of any management plans or strategies that address tiger salamanders as a target? And she says, I'm hoping to learn from other strategies and how these can be applied in a similar landscapes on the prairies. Uh, well, I know that there was a, or there is in the works a recovery strategy for Kisiewicz for for eastern tigers, and I believe there was one for westerns as well. Um, again, mm -hmm. we're we're not really putting the energy into these species. People just don't know they exist, so um, yeah. a lot of them are being ignored. If you if you can get in contact again with the town, it's in Manitoba, but Saint Leon in Manitoba. They they have a museum there, and they also I believe close their highway, and so they might be able to help a little bit more. Um, but it's really difficult to manage a species that you only see twice a year, and then and how do you get them to stop crossing the highway? So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, and then Darren is wondering, would a salamander ever use saline water sources? And he says, in my area, they're basically the only water bodies left after a multi-year drought that we've been experiencing. I don't know much about saline. I, I know a bit about pH specifically and that salamanders can tolerate a fairly significant range of pH. Um, my thesis did look at uh, TDS, so total dissolved solids in the water, um, and they don't tend to tolerate a high range of TDS, which could equate to salinity. So I would say that salinity would probably have a negative effect on the presence of salamanders in an area, which is really unfortunate um, if that's yeah. all that's left. Um, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Hmm, so. It's really sad. Um, and then Andrew's wondering where salamanders will burrow exactly. Well, they'll use other animals' burrows. And so there is a paper out of southern Ontario that says the presence of crayfish uh, is actually an indicator of presence of salamanders because they'll, they'll use those burrows to hide. Um, but they do they are capable of burrowing themselves and so the sandy lands specifically is just that it's sandy and so they can burrow through the sand or use another animal's burrow um i know that in other papers they found the presence of pocket gophers who also correlate with tiger salamander presence and so if you have pocket gophers that's a good good place to look i guess but um yeah, anywhere they can hide or if they have to burrow themselves, they'll do it. I okay. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and then James says that you mentioned um, listening for toads, and he's wondering if there's a website that we can hear recordings of toad songs or toad sounds. Yeah, um, the, the Manitoba Herps Atlas, it's not being maintained anymore, but it does have a great resource on um, the toads in Manitoba. Um, you can go on iNaturalist. Some people will put up records of, of different toad sounds. Um, I know I have some records on there of uh, Cope's gray tree frogs and a few other things that I like to, to have. Um, but the if the Herps Atlas's website is still up, I would suggest looking there. They have the calls, at least for Manitoba. I don't know if Saskatchewan has the same type of thing, but there should be a fair bit of overlap for those species. Yeah, I don't know if Saskatchewan has one. I'm going to have to look that up, but that sounds like a great resource, the Manitoba Herps Atlas. I'm going to have to check that out. <laughs> yeah. And um, just to clarify, the town that you mentioned that um, may have like closed their highway for salamanders, is that St. Leon? Yes, St. Leon, but it's, it's a French town, so yeah, L-E-O-N, I believe. 
Perfect. Okay. And um, Laura is wondering if you know if there are any opportunities for volunteering to help on salamander projects. I don't know of any. Um, there was a, a an attempt to make a salamander cooperative in Manitoba, but I'm not sure if that's been maintained. Um, again, just putting records in iNaturalist is really good. It's, it helps us to see what's out there on the landscape. Um, or, you know, perhaps there's a local herp herpetology group that would be really great to, to look up. Um, yeah, I, I'm not entirely sure, sorry. Yeah, no, that's that's okay. Um, it's possible too, like I know some national parks have volunteer programs as well, so maybe in the future Riding Mountain might have an opportunity, but um, like you said, iNaturalist and just being a citizen scientist and contributing to, to iNaturalist that way would, would probably really help out everyone. So yeah, that's a great suggestion. Thanks, Carla. <laughs> There. And Laura writes in and says, thank you as well. Um, so I think we made it through a record number of questions. <laughs> yeah. And it's um, <laughs> it's um, almost 1 p.m. So I think, um, oh, actually, sorry, I got another question coming in. So I'll give a final warning. If you have any burning questions, feel free to type it in and we'll try to get to it before one here. Um, so Andrew's wondering again, uh, he says, so they use other burrows or dig their own in um, friable soils but not underwater like a frog would and are they specifically associated with um, wet or damp soils in your wetlands um, or just any burrow on overland like on overland burrows they uh, when they're larval they can breathe underwater they have external gills but when they become a terrestrial adults they no longer have that ability so they need to be above the water line um, they tend to be in these damp areas um in the in the sandy lands they burrow into the sand which i assume is probably quite damp once you get down past the frost line but um in in the prairies so the western tiger um uh, is probably just burrowing down into the to the soil which you know at a certain point is is quite moist so yeah they do need to stay stay moist and not dry out um okay yeah Okay, that sounds good. Um, and then Caitlin has commented, oh, and sorry, um, Andrew uh, replied back and says, okay, perfect, thank you, that helps. Um, and Caitlin has commented that there is a Saskatchewan Herpetological Society, so um, that's good to know. I didn't know about them, so thanks, Caitlin, for, for sharing that. And awesome. Yeah. Um, I think that's all the questions that we have. So, um, Carla, I just wanted to sincerely thank you for, for sharing um, your knowledge, your amazing amount of knowledge, and also your enthusiasm with us today. And this has been the first of a Native Prairie Speaker Series webinar about amphibians. And I know you were a little bit nervous, but this was phenomenal. <laughs> it, <Yeah>. was, <laughs> it was really, really well done. So um, I really appreciate you taking the time to share all of your information with us today. And uh, I've had lots of comments coming in to say thank you. It was a great presentation. Um, so I'll reiterate that as well. And um, Yes, thank you so much. Great, thank you very much. Um, to all of our listeners, oh, sorry, go ahead. If you have any questions, you can get a hold of me there, so. Great. Perfect. That's great. Um, to all of our listeners, thank you so much for catching today's webinar. Um, this session is being recorded and I'll upload it to the PCAP YouTube channel in the very near future. If you haven't checked out the YouTube channel, it's a great thing to do on a cold, snowy winter day. Uh, we have lots of different resources there and you can use the search feature to see, um, see what else is there. And um, when you leave today's webinar, there'll be a quick one minute survey. So if you don't mind answering that, we really appreciate it and it'll help us keep our Native Prairie Speaker Series going into the future. And hopefully I'll see everybody in January for a webinar about woody encroachment in Saskatchewan. So with that, thank you so much everyone and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.